Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Houston. So glad you could join us this morning. Uh, a few announcements before we begin. If, if you are visiting with us, and this may be your first uh, time to worship with us, in, in the pew in front of you is a card that looks just like this. It's double-sided. We call this a conversation card. We would love for you to fill that out, place that in the offering plate at the end of service, give you plenty of time to fill that out, scribble you, your name and, you, and your sign down there, and uh, we would love to get your information because we want you to know exactly what's going on here at First Baptist Church, and we simply want to start a conversation with you. So please just drop that in the offering plate at the end of service for us if you're visiting with us. Also, uh, youth uh, we and children, if you're attending a youth camp this week, this Wednesday, and also if you're attending Centra Kid, we're going to have a camp meeting this tonight, excuse me, I was going to say this Sunday, tonight at 5 o'clock in the youth building. I'll have a parent pack for kids. I'll have information and medical forms for both kids and youth. Uh, so please be in attendance for that, and you'll get uh, the best start to uh, camp going on. Also, youth, we leave this Wednesday at 9.30, so please be aware of that for youth camp. You may be sitting there, you may be a parent, or you saying, whoa, I don't know if I signed up or not, or anything like that. You know what? we got extra spots, so if you want to come on and join us for that, we'd love for you to do that as well. Uh, also, to remind you, there will be a no Wednesday night meal this week or for the, uh, the rest of the summer, so we just had our last Wednesday night meal this past week. So just be aware of that. Some of y'all are got to change your whole schedule up, but just be aware of that, please. All right. That's all the announcements I have. Kenny, lead us in worship. Good morning. It's a joy to see you today. Would you please stand? Find someone and tell them how glad you are to see me in God's house. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here. 
We're thankful, Father, for your presence, for not only are you in this building, but you came in with us, Lord. And where two or more are gathered in your name, you are here. And so, Father, we ask that you'll let yourself be known today in our lives, Father, that somehow through the mist of the muck and the mire of our lives that you'll remove those things so that we can hear you without hindrance, that God as individuals will hear what you have to say to us about our own life, dear God. For the life of this church, Father, I pray that you'll speak to us. That, Lord, you'll help us to hear what you have for us, dear God, and that we'll follow your will and your way in everything that we do. It is a joy to be in your presence. And Lord, when we sing these songs to this morning, I pray, dear God, that we'll sing them to you with all of our heart. That when we pray, dear God, we'll pray to you with all of our heart. As we read your word and listen to your voice, God, we ask that we'll hear you, dear God, that we'll focus upon you. It'll be a true day of worship in our lives, dear God, and we'll be changed as we go out and reach a world that so desperately needs Christ. Help us, Father, do more than survive. Help us to thrive, O oh God, because of what Christ has done for us and because of the difference you've made in our lives. We love you dearly, and thank you, Lord, for the privilege of worship this morning. It's only in Christ's name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen.
something more precious than silver. <laughs> Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby is a writer of hymns. She was blind. If I read it right when I was doing a little historical research on this, Kenny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, about 8,500 hymns and poems and those type things that she is credited with putting together. And it was said that one of her songs, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, was one that really brought her to prominence in music, in hymns. And it was said that at a prison service that one of the prisoners was overheard in his deep prayer was, please don't pass me by. And Fanny took that and composed Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. And I heard a version by a group called GLAD, which is five guys that sing a cappella, use these tight jazz harmonies, and I'm not going to be as good as they are, but if uh, I heard their version of it, and this is what came from it. My earnest plea is, is that as I offer this up to my Savior, that you might worship also. Savior, 
Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me. Thou the spring of all my comfort You're more than life to me, to me Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, blessed Savior, hear my humble, humble cry, hear my cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me do not pass me by oh gentle Savior coffee is served if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 25. Thank you, Bart. I appreciate you, buddy. I want you to know it is my hope as your pastor as well as preacher. It is my hope for three things for you. One is that you know the Lord and that you know you know the Lord. It is my deepest desire for your life to know him personally. To have come to the point in your life when you've given your life to him, but also that you live with him and for him. Also, I, I want you to understand what you have when you have Christ. The magnitude of the difference in your life because of Christ. I really want you to know what you've got when you've got Christ, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to take you a lifetime to figure it out. You'll never get there, but it's worth the effort, I promise you. And then the third thing is, I want you to live in response to knowing Christ and knowing what it means to know Christ. To live in response in your worship, to live in response in your personal life, to live in response in your response to others, to live in response to it. Some of that comes by knowing what we can through Christ. Knowing what we can have through Christ, knowing who Christ is, knowing what it means to have Christ. We study the Gospels to understand who Christ is because the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us an account of the earthly ministry of Christ, when he mingled with others, the conversations that he had, the lives he affected, the sacrifice he made, the resurrection that forever changes all of history. It helps us to understand more by uh, looking to, to Christ, what he's done and, and what he said to us. The rest of the New Testament, from Acts into Revelation, the rest of the New Testament is to help us better understand what Christ did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How to apply that to our life and what that means in the daily walk of, of, of our life. To, to understand it spiritually, to understand it theologically, to understand it personally. Because if we can get a grasp on that, it makes all the difference in the world in our lives. However, what I've described to you is only the back third or maybe... 
quarter of the Bible. That first two-thirds to three-fourths is the Old Testament. And I'll tell you, no matter how many times you've tried to read the Bible through and coughed it up in Leviticus, <laughs> I'll tell you that all of the Old Testament speaks to not only the God's people before Christ came and the movement and the actions of God in, in their life, before Christ took on human flesh and lived and died for us. But the reality is the whole of the, the Old Testament points to Christ as well. So what you have is you have the Gospels that are focused upon Christ, and you have everything since the Gospels looking back to Christ, and everything before the Gospels looking to Christ. For the Old Testament prophesies of Christ... The writings tell us in many ways that he's coming and what he's going to do when he comes. The Old Testament promises Christ. So much of what is celebrated in the New Testament is in, excuse me, what's celebrated in the Old Testament is in preparation for Christ coming. The Old Testament proclaims Christ. Before you ever read of his accounts, before he was ever born of a virgin, God established the foresights in the prophets of old to proclaim the necessity of Christ and how Christ would be at the centrality of our faith. There may not, that may not be seen any greater in all of the Bible than in the Old Testament place of worship. And in Exodus chapter 25 through 40, there are specific instructions on how to build a place for proper worship. And the intent of those instructions was for one purpose. For one purpose. It's found in Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 8. Well, it is verse 8. And it simply says this. God said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the promise that you give us that you are here with us, O oh God. I pray that we'll grasp what that means, Father, and that the decisions that we make in our life and the directions that we go in our life and the things that we do in our life, dear God, will reflect the truth of that. Even more so as we study your word together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis begins the Old Testament and it tells us how the Israelites came to be. It goes from two people to many people. And uh, we see the growth that happens there. And then in, 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 in Exodus, it tells us that, that Egypt grew very strong. And Israel was growing stronger. And Egypt, basically the ruler of the known world at the time, was concerned about the strength of Israel and needed the help of Israel. And so they overpowered them and enslaved them and made them their workers. They were Egyptian, Egypt's prime bricklayers. In fact, as Egypt was growing, they're the ones that were building it. And if you were to go to Egypt today... And you will see the pyramids that are built. Uh, archaeologists and historians will tell you that they were built about the same time that Israel was enslaved in Egypt. And I believe that's exactly what they were working on. As they built those bricks out of clay under ridiculous quotas and were enslaved there. Thankfully, through Moses, God set them free from such enslavement. And, and then... Exodus tells us how God convinced Pharaoh, and it took some convincing, but, but he, he did, and he, he let the people go free. And once they were on their way to the promised land, God gave them instructions in, in how to live, how to get along, how to properly acknowledge God. And just like us, they were an imperfect people. It took them too long to get where they needed to go because they didn't listen very well. You ever known anybody like that? You can bump your neighbor and say, you're just like that, so am I. But his instructions, his law, uh, 
make up the second portion of the book of Exodus, as the first tells us how they got out of Egypt. And then he wanted to establish for them a place of worship. A nomad moving people, he wanted to establish for them a place of worship, a place that would be front and center and would allow them to be centered upon worship. Now, you need to understand they were a traveling nomadic people, a tent-dwelling people, trying to get to a land that God had promised them. And so everything they had had to be portable. They, they were a, a tent-dwelling people, therefore their sanctuary had to be a, 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 called the tabernacle, had to be portable. And, and it had to be durable because it was very portable. And, and so uh, their hard-heartedness kept them wandering around a lot longer in the desert than they should have, and therefore they needed a place to worship and they needed to be able to move it. And the third part of the book of Exodus gives specific instructions on how to make and how to use the tabernacle, this centralized, portable place of worship. Now let me give you a quick history lesson that's going to encapture most of, the, of Scripture. Once the people get to the promised land, under Joshua, after Moses has led them in the desert for all this time, once they get there, they, they were able to build a permanent place of worship. In the center of, of Jerusalem, King David had a burden to do it, and, gave the, and God wouldn't allow him, and gave the task to his son Solomon, and Solomon became king and built the permanent tabernacle, also called the, the temple, or at least that was intended to be permanent, and he built it honestly with a lot of the supplies that his father had collected after he found out he couldn't build it himself. He set his boy up by using his relationships with people to make sure that he had what he needed to build what God had established him to build. And the, ta the temple was built much greater than the tabernacle. For one, it was permanent. It was in a permanent spot, didn't have to be moved. But the other thing, it was, it was, it was twice the size. Even the inner sanctum was, was twice the size. It went from 100 square cubics to 200 square cubics. And, and, and once built, the, the Ark of the Covenant that housed the, the Ten Commandments and Aaron's budding rod, two sure signs of the Lord's holy presence and, and, and leading them, was placed in the inner sanctum there in the Holy of Holies. And the temple was the center of all that God's people did. It, 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 the Lord, through His Word, was very clear on what they were to do in the temple and how they were to do it. But I'll tell you, as great as the erection of the temple was, the loss was even greater. For when the Babylonian kingdom became strong under Nebuchadnezzar, they attacked the Israelites. They attacked them, and then they attacked them again, and then they attacked them again. There were three waves of attack over 20 years, and through those devastating attacks, the city was destroyed, the temple was desecrated, and the people were dispersed to opposition under the Babylonians. It was not as bad as slavery in the, under Egypt, but they were not at home, and they were under the oppression of the Babylonians. It was too much like the previous sla slavery in Egypt. So when Israel was exiled in Babylonia... Babylonia grew weak, the Persian army grew strong, and overtook the Babylonian Empire. And the Persian king's name was Cyrus. God touched Cyrus and allowed, and he allowed Israel to go back and build their temple again. He, he even made provisions for them to be able to do that. And the people were able to go home, and they were able to build now, they got sidetracked along the way. <laughs> Sometimes they got concerned about their own stuff and their own house instead of God's house. And, and it took way too long, much longer than it should have. They got complacent about the rebuilding. But God raised up prophets. That's how we got the Old Testament. He raised up prophets to ag them on and to rebuild to make sure that it was successful. And in 70 AD, a time after the Gospels, as well as... Uh, the narrative of Scripture, although some of it was written after 70 A.D., that temple was destroyed by the Romans in a siege of Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount lay dormant 
for 600 years until the Muslims built the Dome of the Rock that sits on that spot today. That's the history of the place of worship for Israel. The message of the tabernacle, the portable predecessor of the temple, as well as the temple itself, I will tell you the message to those is much larger than the buildings themselves. There is great messages that flow through the images that is portrayed in Scripture, even through the furniture that is placed in the tabernacle and the temple and the structure and the way that it's built and the way that it's laid out and the worship that takes place there. Those messages about that are not just for the Old Testament folks that were dealing with it at the time. It is for us as well. Those are not just messages for the Jews. It's not just messages for biblical history buffs. The messages that are proclaimed through these worship errors are foundational truths that everyone's faith in Christ is based upon. And so this has been my struggle for years. I've had a seed within me that wanted to study and preach on the tabernacle, the temple, to some degree to, for us all to better understand what that worship means and how that affects us today. And I kept coming back to, are people really going to think this is relevant? I mean, the truth of the matter is, you've had stuff to deal with this week. Life is real. And, and when you deal with stuff in life, you need answers. So many times when people open up the Word of God, they go, Lord, <laughs> you know what's going on. Will you help me? You know, and hope they point to the right place. Well, that's not a healthy biblical uh, doctrine <laughs> or biblical study. But I, I will tell you that I know, I know where you live. I don't know everything about it. I don't need to. I just know that however hard we try to dress up and look right on Sunday, it's a house full of fallible people. We all got stuff. And some of it came on us, and some of it we brought it on, and some of it's debatable. <laughs> Either way, we all need help. So do we really have time on Sunday morning, such a precious time, to go back and look at a history lesson of the architectural plan of a house of worship that was picked up and torn down and picked up and torn down and picked up and torn down for 40 years? Do, do we really need that? And I want you to be clear this morning. Yes, we do. Because I've been sitting on this for probably 15 years at least. I heard a sermon about it a long time ago that stirred my heart. And I sat on it. And then about two years ago, God really began to place that in me. And it rose up as I began to plan for 2017. It rose up, and now I understand the timing, and I hope you will too. I understand the timing much more than I ever did before. So I want you to understand something. This is not something that I've ever preached before, and it's not something that I'm just falling back on because I don't have anything else to say because you know me. i got plenty to say. It is instead what I believe God has, has led us to, and so we can hear these messages about these worship areas because they are the foundational truths that everyone's faith in Christ is based on. For by understanding the tabernacle, you have the un opportunity to understand your faith more or maybe your lack of faith. But I want you to remember something. I told you when I first started this this morning that my effort is that you know the Lord. I want you to know him personally. It is not enough for you to be a member of First Baptist Church. It's not enough for you to be affiliated with the church. It's not enough for you to just believe in Christ. Folks, I want you to know that you know that you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and that if he were to allow you your last breath today that you knew for certainty, you would spend eternity with him. I want you to be certain about that. Not just life insurance and not just eternal insurance. 
but for the sake of the quantity, and not, not, not the quantity, but the quality of life that you can have in Christ. I want that for you. But the other thing I want you to understand is, I want you to understand what you have when you have Christ. Because if I were to go door to door in Houston and ask people, are you a Christian? The vast majority would tell me yes. When I begin to try to get them to define what that means in their life, it would go downhill fast. And it shouldn't for you. And so I want you to understand what it means to have Christ. And then I want you to live in response to it. And the reality is that we as Christians, as a whole, don't live in response to it. Because the effect on the world in which we live is weak and somewhat anemic. And that is not God's fault. Because he's just as powerful as he ever was. The reality is we live a culturalized American Christianity that's been watered down to our comfort level to make us feel secure about what we want to feel secure about and leave alone what we want to leave out. And there's nothing biblical about that. And so my hope is that let's go down to the bare bones of what God wanted to establish as worship and help us understand what it means to live in response to what he's given us in Christ and what he gives us Every day that we have spent, we will spend the rest of our life understanding and knowing. That is the hope. I believe God's led us to study the tabernacle to better understand what we have when we have Christ. And so what I'm hoping to establish and accomplish through this study is one, that you know the Lord. That you know the Lord. John 1 verse 14 describes the incarnation of Christ and says, as the word was becoming flesh and he dwelt among us. The the point of the portable tabernacle was to point out to God's people that God was not only sitting on Mount Sinai where they got the Ten Commandments from and where the law was established, but that God was with them everywhere, that he tabernacled with them. That as they were on the move, God was moving with them, leading them all the way with a a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That Christ came to earth in human flesh so that we once again can be one with a holy God in spite of our lack of holiness. And that Christ came so that we, even me, could have a personal relationship with him. But by asking the Lord Jesus to forgive us of the wrong we've done, to acknowledge how we've let him down and to, to, to admit that we've gone astray and, and, and that our desires in our life have been put at the forefront of our lives instead of his desires for our life, that we've done it our way and now it's time that we say, oh dear God, I want to do it your way. I want you to lead the way. It is a surrender of ourselves to him. A lifelong commitment to God to give him all that we are. We can study the inner workings of the Old Testament worship so that we can see the opportunity that we have to come to God today through what Christ has done for us. My greatest desire is that if you don't know the Lord, you'll come out the back of this knowing Christ Jesus personally and resting in him. Second reason we study the temple The tabernacle, excuse me, is this. You understand what you have when you have him. Every act of worship in the tabernacle, every piece of furniture in the tabernacle was was there as an illustration of a different aspect of what we have in Christ Jesus. The book of Hebrews explains a lot of that, how the activity in the tabernacle and in the temple relate to the Christian today. And in the midst of that explanation that the Hebrew writer gives to us, he says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, he says, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. In other words, we have Christ, folks. And he has pitched his tent among us. He has tabernacled with us. He is dwelling with us. He goes on, the Hebrew writer does, to explain that the whole point of the layout and the activity of the tabernacle was to point to Christ. Therefore, we'll study piece by piece so that you know more and more of what you have when you have Christ. Oh, preacher, why study the tabernacle so that we can live in response 
to what he's given to us. After the Hebrew writer explains so much of what we're going to talk about, the imagery and the symbols of the worship of the tabernacle, he made it very clear why we study it. He said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, he says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from our evil conscience and our bodies washed with, with pure water. L listen, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Listen, and let us con consider how uh, to stir one another on to love and, and, and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in, the, as in the habit of some, but encouraging all the more as you see the day drawing near. Friend, he shares these things, and I share these things, that we can live confidently for the Lord, not struggling with the woolly wiles of the evil one that's so very real in each one of our lives. That we can walk close to God with full assurance that the one that we put our faith in is real indeed and real in our lives. We teach these things so that we can live by our confession of knowing that in Christ we're washed clean and made free. and That Christ has set us free and now thank God we're free indeed. That we can respond to others. Oh folks that we can respond to others as if we've been hugely affected by the difference that Christ makes in our life. That we may stir one another on. So I ask you, do you know him personally? Have you ever come to the point in your life when you said, God, I, it's enough of me trying to do it because I've done a bad job. I've done wrong. God, will you forgive me and cleanse me and come into my life and strengthen me as I surrender my life to you and change me forever? Friend, the truth of the matter is what Scripture tells us is he'll do it every time somebody asks. But he will not force his way, and you don't get it from your grandpa or your aunt or your brother. It comes on your personal surrender to Christ. And if that's never happened in your life, I'm telling you, today can be the greatest day of your life if you'll give your heart and life to Christ. If you have done that, do you realize the difference that he makes in your life? Be honest, not with me, but with God and with yourself. Are you walking confidently in him or are you in the midst of a struggle? Are you stirring others on in strong faith? Or are you just stirring up others? <laughs> are you compromising your faith all along the way with other believers? Or are you committed and strengthening others as you go? Before we ever learn a thing, in order for it to have the effect that it needs to have, we need to have the heart that we need to have. And it is my hope that you know the Lord and that you did dedicate your life today to understanding what you have when you have Christ and make that the rest of your life journey. And then to look at how am I responding to what Christ has done in me. I mean, if I can speak confidently about my salvation in Christ, how does that work in how I respond to others? Let's be clean before the Lord so that we can hear him completely and know what he has to say to us and have the right heart to respond properly when he gives us direction. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't know how God's speaking to you today, but I know you'll never be satisfied 
until you follow his will in your way in your life. And it's a great opportunity for you. We'll stand in just a moment. We'll sing, and it's an open invitation for you to come as God leads you to come, to make decisions as God leads you to make decisions, to follow the Lord in all of your life. Lord Jesus, I love you, and I thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Help us, dear God, to be faithful, to follow your will and your way in everything that you say to us this morning, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together, if you will. As we sing, you obey God as he speaks to your heart and life. Speak Jesus. Let's sing it together. together. Father God, it's so good to be able to be here this morning, Lord, to hear your word preached, to sing praises to your name. We thank you for that opportunity. Lord, I thank you for a chance that we can look back and we can see how you instructed the Israelites to build the temple. 
Lord, most of all, I thank you for that day that Jesus gave his life for us, Lord, and that, that veil of that temple was rent from top to bottom. Lord, it opened up a line of communication with you that we can never get over. Lord, I pray that we'd use it. We'd visit with you. We'd talk to you. We'd have that relationship that you'd have us to have. God, we have an opportunity now to give back. Lord, you've blessed us all. I pray, Father, we'd be faithful that we would give, and Lord, that we could take what's given and make a difference to share Jesus with those around us and all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. household um, I was told a couple of weeks ago that one was going to come and the other wanted to come and they were going to well she's already coming so and then uh, that was the night that I talked about my trip to Guinea and we didn't have an invitation so nobody came and and then and then Mother's Day is probably a little overwhelming so they come this morning uh, Sophie and Leanna Simmons come proclaiming that they've given their heart and life to the Lord Jesus they want to be baptized and join our church. If you're happy they've come this morning, you say amen. 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 Y'all can sit right there for just a minute. And uh, y I know you'll want to tell them how proud you are of uh, their decision and their boldness to uh, stand before you, your intimidating bunch. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure you want to encourage them. Stand together, if you will. Let's join hands across the way and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity you give us to worship this morning, dear God. Thank you, Lord, for lives being changed. And I pray, dear God, that you'll help us to, uh, to be zealous, to be hungry, to see even more come to know the Lord Jesus, Father. That you'll move and work in our lives and help us respond to the world that so desperately needs the gospel, Father, by sharing the hope that we only have in Christ. Lead us as we leave this place and draw us back tonight as we celebrate so much of the good things you're doing, Father. We ask, God, that you'll lead us to keep our eyes upon you in all that we do. We love you dearly. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Only in Christ's name that we pray. And God's, all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing together. Amen. 